Um, so good morning, everyone, and uh, I'm glad you could join us today. I've got to admit, um, I've never started a conference before, so I'm a little nervous, uh, so bear with me a little bit. But uh, I'm going to talk to you about happy teams make better code. So a um, bit about me, since you didn't hear about me. Uh, I do work for a company called D2L, or Desire to Learn. Uh, our headquarters is based at a Kitchener-Waterloo area, just uh, about an hour that way-ish, maybe that way, that way, somewhere an hour from here. Uh, we do have an office in Toronto. Uh, I am uh, engineering director with D2L, and I run the foundation division. So I work in the back end, uh, all the stuff that nobody really gets to see, but makes everything hopefully work pretty well. Uh, what D2L does is we make learning management software. So if you went to uh, Waterloo as a customer of ours, Laurier, I think Toronto might be as well. Or if you've been to school, school's pretty good, you should check it out. Um, and you've used the software where your professors put stuff online for you, you've taken an online course, we build stuff like that. Um, currently my project is re-architecting our solution so we can achieve proper web scale in AWS. We're a 15 year old company, when we built our product, I don't think the internet existed yet, so we sort of built a lot of weird stuff that, uh, and of course you never go back and fix it, and we finally get to go back and fix it, so that's, that's what I'm doing right now. Prior to that, um, my project prior to that was to take us from delivering once or twice a year to our customers to doing what we call continuous delivery, which is delivering monthly, because uh, monthly is continuous. It is when you change the definition, um, and it worked out really well. All right, so um, why are we all here today? That's a good question. That's it, that's all I've got. Really deep, it's a philosophical talk, mostly. Now, um, I'm assuming you're here because you either uh, work as a developer, you work with developers, you might be a team lead, you might be a manager, you might be just moving into it or falling into that position. What is it that we want our developers doing when they come into work? Is it just writing code? Is it just getting them in front of the computer and just churning out as much code as we possibly can and getting that out into production? I'd argue that it's not. And for myself, I went into engineering partially because of this guy. Um, I assumed that if I went into engineering, I'd make lots of money, I'd look really cool, and I got, I'd get to solve cool problems. Luckily for me, one of three of those things actually happened. It's the cool part, in case you're wondering. Um, no, I'm not cool. I have kids. I'm not cool anymore. Um, they tell me that every day. So what I would argue is, is we actually want to focus our teams on problem solving. Code is just the medium that we choose to use to solve our problems in. Get a little feedback there. So how do we help accentuate problem solving in our groups? So I'd argue that there are four things that you need in order to be able to solve a problem. You need knowledge. So you need knowledge of the problem space, knowledge of the solution space, and knowledge of the tooling you're going to use to bridge the gap between those two things. You then need the requisite skills to actually execute upon those tools. You also need creativity because it's a problem. If, it, if you already knew the answer to the problem, then you would have solved it by now. So that implies that you don't know the answer, which means you have to figure out the answer. And that's where the creativity comes in of taking things that you've done in the past and twisting them and warping them to try them out in a different way to solve this particular problem. That, of course, means that you're then going to need experimentation because you don't know the answer. So you're going to have to try something. It might work. If it does, cool. Go home. If it doesn't work, try something else. So I want to focus first on knowledge and skills. Now, I'm going to assume that your teams have a base set of knowledge and skills, and we're not trying to take people who don't know what a computer is and get them ready to go. So instead of what I want to focus on is how do you keep your teams on the cutting edge of knowledge and skills? So I used to be a front-end developer before I ended up at the back end of the stack, which was really scary at first because they're like, we're going to use Jenkins to deploy a server. And I'm like, a Jenkins? Who's Jenkins? And they're like, no, it's a thing. Um, it was even worse because we had a guy on the team named Travis. So for a while there, <laughs> we're like, Travis is broken again. I'm like, damn it, Travis. Can you just get some work? He's like, it's not me. It's this thing. I'm like, well, no, it's your name. Um, so how do you keep people learning stuff? Uh, there were, sorry, I had a reason for that whole conversation. Um, JavaScript, if you're a JavaScript developer, I think every time I open my eyes, there's a new JavaScript framework out there. So how do you keep on top of all the new things that are coming out? Obviously, conferences are a great way to do that. 
and you're all here doing that, so therefore it must be good. But, <laughs> no? Come on, okay. Uh, you still, you're waiting for those sick rhymes to come out, maybe at the end. You're all going to leave here today if you've gone to a conference before. I know for myself, I leave conferences usually feeling really excited and pumped, and I'm like, okay, when I hit back work on Monday, I'm going to change everything. My company's going to be the greatest company that's ever company to company before because I've got all these awesome ideas that I'm going to unleash upon them. And then usually Tuesday hits, and I'm booked into back-to-back -back meetings, and I've forgotten everything that I was supposed to do, and I'm just trying to churn through all the different weird things I've got to get done on a daily basis. How do you take the things you've learned here and apply them into your day-to-day. -day. And that's where a concept known as Slack time comes in. And this is different than Slack, the chat tool. This is about building time in your schedule, basically for nothing. Okay, you've got to keep that time free. And you should be encouraging and helping your teams do this. I'm pretty sure those are pants. I've used this slide a few times. I think they're pants. They could be tattoos. If they're tattoos, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty sick tattoos he's got there. I'm also not entirely sure what they're over top of. And I have a small fear of heights, as in like a large fear of heights. So this picture actually gives me a little bit of vertigo. I don't know why I use it, but I like it. It's, it's like slacking, I guess. Um, so I've experimented with a number of different ways of giving my team slack time. The way that we've landed on now is what I call communal slack time which is basically for my organization, I book a, a two hours a week in everyone's calendar that's just called slack time. We're doing this after lunch now because I find after lunch you come back, you know, you're kind of got to get back into the, into, the, uh, into the grind. I'm not going to disrupt you if you've managed to make it into the zone. Um, and you can just sort of come back and know you're going to use that time. The reason why we landed on that, I used to say to people, just book time, you know, take a couple hours a week, Book it in your calendar so you know you've had that with yourself and do that whenever you want to do that, when that fits with you. And I found that didn't work. And what happened was, um, well, I'll pick on Travis again. Hopefully he's not watching the live stream. Um, if Travis's slack time comes up, you know, it's, it's two o'clock when he's booked his slack time. He's like, okay, cool, I'm gonna read this awesome book I got. And he goes to open the book and he looks next to him you know, at his desk mate, and Sally's there just churning through code to try to hit the deadlines for the sprint. Travis is going to feel bad about that. He's going to go, oh, I feel really bad sitting here reading a book while my teammates are trying to crunch code and get that code out the door. And what people would do is they just wouldn't use the slack time. They would just fill it with more work. By doing it communally, everyone can look up and look around and go, okay, well, we're all doing it, so therefore it must be okay. It also gives me a chance as a leader to model the correct behavior I want to see. So I usually grab a book. I like books. Books are pretty cool. Uh, I grab a beanbag chair because they're also pretty cool. That ups my cool rating from in like, the negative area to getting closer to zero, but not quite there yet. And I make myself fairly visible, and I just read. That way they can look at me and go, well, if the boss is doing it, it must be okay. And that helps encourage other people to do that as well. So what are some ideas that you can use for slack time? So I've mentioned books. Uh, we've actually experimented with a book club as well. At one point, we called it books and... I was going to call it books and beer, and then HR told me I couldn't call it books and beer because that wasn't inclusive enough. I had to call it books and booze. So that way I included all different kinds of alcohol because <laughs> HR was fond of wine. So, and yeah, it was uh, not what I expected out of HR, but HR gained a couple cool points in, me, in my books there. Um, I recently sent someone to QCon, and uh, if one of the perks of going to QCon when you come back is you get early access to all the videos. So we actually booked communal video watching time. We wheeled a TV into a meeting room. This developer had a bunch of talks that he went to and saw that he thought were great, that he thought the team would really benefit from, and we sat down and watched it together. I brought in snacks, um, and uh, we'd watch that, and we actually focused a lot on uh, chaos engineering principles, because we hadn't tried that yet, and it was
What a handoff. Now I feel like I'm in a relay race. All right. Um, just taking time to hack. Maybe they have something new that they want to try that um, they've never done before and they just can't find the time to try it out. That's a great thing to do as well. Um, or starting to learn a new programming language. Tons of new programming languages are coming out all the time. Getting a chance to learn one of those and have some time to experiment while at work is a great opportunity as well. I'm just going to pause. People are taking pictures. I'm assuming of the symptom, Simpsons uh, image there. Okay. Now, if there is one rule to slack time, it is this. You have to trust your team to pick something themselves. You cannot direct what they're going to do with the slack time. If you say, okay team, it's now slack time, everyone sit down and start doing code, it's no longer slack time. You've taken away that time from them. So it's free time. You can provide ideas, you can provide resources, you can buy books, you can pay for subscriptions to online courses. You can provide all that, but at the end of the day, you have to trust the team and your teammates to actually pick things to do in the Slack time. Uh, other things that I've done in the past is I've booked meeting rooms that I just leave open, and if uh, team members want to go in there and talk about stuff or debate stuff, then they can go do that. Basically, just provide as much opportunity for them to do what they need to do, but then let them do that. Okay, I'm available to provide ideas and suggestions, uh, but I'm not going to tell them what they need to do at that time. All right, so Slack time, great way to help build knowledge and skills. I'm going to move on now to creativity. There was a, a psychologist, Abraham Maslow, who created Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And yes, um, it's not exact. It's a model. We're going to use it as a model. This isn't exactly how stuff works, but it's a great way to help frame what we're going to do next. So basically, the idea is you need to satisfy the things in the bottom rungs of the pyramid before you start moving up in higher rungs of the pyramid. So if you're hungry, then you're not going to be feeling very good about yourself or you're not going to be very creative. And I used to be a teacher and that's, I, I, from my experience, when kids would come to school hungry, you wouldn't get anything out of them that day. So that's where a lot of breakfast programs and snack programs have started up to try to make sure that when kids come to school, they're, they're able and ready to learn. So let's start at the bottom. There's not a lot, obviously we can't help them with breathing. If they're having trouble with breathing, then call the first aid team. Maybe call 911 is good too. Um, but this is where snacks or catered lunches can come in handy. You know, after lunch I get kind of tired, I get hungry. If I'm hungry, I'm not thinking about the problem I want to be solving. I'm not dedicating as many brain resources to it as I can. So having those snacks available means that uh, I can just go grab something. Now, I don't know, this is probably the worst picture of snacks ever. I think if you let these snacks out, to your dev teams, they would revolt and, and probably murder you. <laughs> like veggie cups, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, but yeah, none of those things. Well, I guess the fruit probably looks okay. But Another great thing is flex time. And I know a lot of dev companies are doing flex time now, but allowing people to start when they're ready to start, allowing them to work to whatever time they want to work till, uh, letting them work from home if they've got packages or repairmen coming or the kids need to stay home from school because they're feeling sick. Uh, even in my office, I sometimes have to bring my kids in to work with me. And then we just steal one of the dashboard TVs and they watch Power Rangers all day. But I know that I can do that and then I can watch Power Rangers with them because it's pretty good. Original Power Rangers, of course. You've got to go old school on that one. Um, but having that flexibility means that's one less worry that I need to have and one less thing that's pulling away resources from me trying to apply that to my problem solving abilities. Moving up, safety. Um, once again, some of this does apply here, so safety of employment, not feeling like I'm going to be fired all the time if I make a misstep, if I don't do the right thing. But making sure that you do have a safe environment at work where people feel comfortable coming into work, they don't feel that they're going to be ridiculed, uh, that they're going to be belittled at work, is an is a awesome first step and should be basically step zero of your, of your office. Um, other parts of this are making sure that people have enough money available to satisfy their, their base needs. If people are worried about paying the bills, whether they're going to have enough money to pay the mortgage, then once again, they're not thinking and applying those... those uh, I've been watching a lot of Trailer Park Boys lately, and I really want to say like brain thinkings, um, but that's not a real thing unless you watch Trailer Park Boys. Um, but it'd be, they're not applying their, their brain power to solving the problems at hand. 
there's research that says once you hit 75k a year, no more, like you don't, more money won't make you more happy. Um, there's also now a lot of research that says that that's not necessarily true. That money can in fact buy happiness, because money can buy freedom and it can buy security. And those two things, which this man probably has a lot of those things, um, help make you feel better about yourself. Okay? If you don't need to worry about the bills, if you can go on a nice trip every year, those things will help you relax and you'll get better performance out of, uh, out of your employees. So the point of this is, is when a staff member comes to you to have the dreaded, I think I don't make enough money talk, hear them out. I know that that's a hard conversation that you then need to bring upstairs to your boss and to HR to argue for more money for them, but do try to hear them out and try to see it from their side of things and see what you can do to try to help them out with that. Okay. Friendship, family comes next. I'm sure we've all worked at a place where we wake up in the morning and we love to come into work. We're super excited to get there. We're kind of sad when we leave at the end of the day. And a good chunk of that is probably the people you work with. You might not actually see them outside of work, but you probably count them among your friends, right? You, you enjoy working with them, you trust them, and you're ready to go. So you could almost say that friendship is magic. I have watched this show. My kids were pretty into it for a while. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, I don't remember the character names. We're now into Power Rangers, so that's, that's pretty good too. Basically the same show, um, just slightly different characters. How do you go ahead and start blossoming that friendship within the team? Trust is a huge factor in that, and letting the team be able to trust one another will help build up friendships on the team, and that comes a lot from you as a leader on your team. So you saying what you're gonna do and then doing what you just said you're gonna do will help build that trust. Being fair with the team, helping them when they have troubles, helping them when they have missteps is gonna help build that trust. And a team that ships code together often has a lot of trust and a team that fails together will even build more trust because they understand that when they make mistakes, it's okay and we're gonna grow and we're gonna learn from that. Another great way to help building that up is a mentorship relationship. So even for your most top senior devs in the company, Everyone should try to have a mentor within the company or from outside the company if you can't find anybody in the company. A couple of recommendations here. Your mentor shouldn't be your boss. Um, the mentor relationship does differ a bit from the uh, employee-boss relationship, and you might want to share things with your mentor about your boss, which is really awkward to do if your mentor is your boss. Um, but trying to help all your junior devs especially and your junior people on your team get mentors who are more senior in the company, can help build good relationships across teams and across divisions in your company, and then also help to level up um, the people on your team, and that also works nicely with that slack time idea we talked about before. Step up, moving in now to self-esteem, confidence, achievement. One of the best things you can do as a manager is provide Good, timely, and effective feedback. So what I mean by that is, uh, feedback needs to be timely. Um, if you take a, a week to give feedback about something, it no longer matters as much to that person. We've all moved on, and it feels a little bit more nitpicky. What I mean by effective is, it, it's great to give positive feedback, and positive feedback is fantastic. If all you ever get is positive feedback, it starts to feel like people aren't really paying any attention to what it is you're doing. And they're just saying words because they feel like they you know, heard somewhere that feedback is good, so I should give feedback, so I'm gonna give good feedback. If you're worried about giving constructive feedback or even negative feedback to your team, then you're lacking that trust relationship. You need to work on that first. Make sure that you feel like you can trust your team and they can trust you so that you can start working on giving that constructive feedback. One thing I find with uh, managers, new managers, is if they don't come from a development background, so I come from a development background, um, but I didn't come from a product background. So I have people that report to me who do uh, product work. I don't know how to give them feedback on if their product work is good. So what I do there is I find someone who can. And what I, something I am good at is giving feedback. So I can help mentor that person who's good at product on how to give good feedback and I can leverage their product knowledge to then give feedback to my product person. Okay. It's a great technique as well. I have developers on my team who could outdevelop me probably with both hands tied behind their back 
and blindfolded without a computer. I can't give them feedback. I look at their code and go, oh, that was cool. I didn't even know you could do that thing. So what I do, same thing again, try to find someone else who can give them that feedback and train them up on how to give good feedback and then leverage their skills to help me out. But what I do find is a lot of times the feedback you need to give is more about the soft skills. It's about the interpersonal relationships. It's about the cross-team relationships. Um, and that stuff you should be able to ha handle on your own. Something that my company started doing for recognition is Lego. We all love Lego. So when we, uh, when we ship something, we get a Lego brick. When we do something cool, we get a Lego brick. When you last another year at the company, you get a Lego brick. Um, and this is a great way to give recognition. It's a good, good way to give recognition that people can then put on their desk and share. So when I go to someone else's desk, I can see all the awesome stuff that they've done. Uh, I've, I've built mine up with my minions because that represents my role in the company. Um, and that way when people come to my desk and they see that I've cut the head off the Cyclops, they know it instills fear in them so they know how to, how to deal with me appropriately. But it's a great idea. URL's there for the company that we get the Lego bricks from. I think it's like a dollar a brick. So it's really cheap and people love it. Um, they get super excited when the bricks come out uh, and we come up with new bricks and new ideas to recognize the work that people are doing. That then brings us to the top. We're now at the point where we can start to become creative. People think creativity means thinking outside the box. That if I have any constraints, I'm gonna stifle creativity. That all I need is a blank canvas and freedom and I will be so creative, I will create everything that you've ever thought and never thought about. It doesn't actually work that way. In fact, to maximize creativity, you do need to know where you're going. Someone needs to set a direction, a vision of what it is you want to achieve. You're also gonna need guardrails. You're gonna need to know what's acceptable. How much money can I spend? How long am I allowed to take doing this? Are there tech restrictions? Are there product restrictions that I need to follow? But that sounds like it's getting very close to alignment. And alignment, in a lot of people's eyes, stifles autonomy, which is what we feel we need in order to become creative. In my mind, it actually works more like a matrix. When you can maximize alignment by setting a clear vision with clear guidelines, you actually can maximize people's autonomy in allowing them to make the day-to-day -day decisions that they need to make to get their work done. So what we want to focus on then is setting a clear why. And you may have seen Simon Sinek's TED talk about start with why. If you haven't, it's a great TED talk. Uh, it's from a marketing standpoint, but a lot of the same ideas apply here. Your job as a leader is to set that clear vision as to what it is you want out of your team. You then help them set those guardrails. How much money can they spend? How long can they take? What does the product need to look like? What box does it need to fit in when I ship it? They then get the freedom to decide how they solve it. And that's where their autonomy lies. And those constraints help them maximize the autonomy in how they come to that solution. And that freedom will let them come up with ideas that, that you would not have been able to come up with on your own. A technique I use with my crew is, is this. When we start a new project, I have everybody who's on that project fill this out. So we're working on X because we think it's going to give Y, which benefits the project or company because of Z, and we're done when. Everyone needs to fill it out individually, and we compare, because everyone needs to have ownership of that vision to have maximum autonomy in executing against that vision. The cool thing is, is the we're done when part translates nicely into metrics that you can then dashboard to show progress on the project. And that gets you some of your reporting you need to do upstairs to keep the bosses happy. And then also gives the team a chance to see their work actually having an effect as they're burning down whatever it needs to do or adopting what they need to adopt or changing whatever they need to change. So key point here, autonomy needs purpose in order to flourish. Autonomy without purpose, people are gonna feel like they're floundering, they don't know what they're doing, they're just, they're just you know, writing code for the sake of writing code because if they stop writing code, someone might notice and then fire them. The mastery, the slack time we talked about earlier, gives me the time to explore and apply the things I'm learning, which can help then maximize my mastery. And this comes from Dan Pink's book, Drive, another great book if you haven't read that book. Now that you have slack time available to you, lots of book, book reading time you can do. So people require safety, sense of belonging, and esteem to be able to be creative and to unlock that creativity. And creativity requires 
constraints and alignment to become purposeful. Finally, we had experimentation. I used to be a science teacher, actually, um, so I did set fire to a few things. I've electrocuted myself far more times than I would like to share, which I just shared, and it's being live streamed, so it's recorded now for posterity. But um, experimentation means you're going to fail at some point. So at your company, failure can't be a bad word. In a lot of companies, failure is a four-letter word. We're afraid to use it. We're afraid to talk about our failures. You need to start embracing failure. So what happens if you have a team that's scared to fail? Well, a technique that I've used in the past is to actually set myself up to fail in front of the team and once again do um, that modeling technique I mentioned. So modeling is one of the best ways you can help change behavior out of people. And in fact, I think it's one of the only ways you can change behavior that's legal. Um, so I do small micro experiments. So at a retro, I might say I'm going to change, we're going to change how we do our sprints. And I know it's probably not going to work, but it's, I'm only going to try it for two weeks till the next retro. We're going to talk about it. And I'm going to expose the fact that this didn't work. Why didn't it work? What are we going to do now? I'll use the word failure a lot um, because that tends to help drive it home that that's what I'm talking about. You're going to have to do this a lot. It's going to take months and months of doing this until the team starts to kind of sink in and feel like, okay, we can actually start to now talk about our failures. I don't need to hide them. I don't need to be afraid about them. Okay, because success isn't easy. Success is messy. We tend to, when we're talking about success, when we're reading about successes, we tend to ignore the mess. We tend to talk about how you know, they started in a garage, they wrote some code, someone threw money at them, and now they're, they've got a solid gold house. That's not how it actually works. There's mistakes, there's, there's fights, people quit, and there's a whole lot of luck involved. So you need to help make that a reality and help share that with your team so that they feel comfortable talking about those things. So finally, experimentation requires embracing failure. So failure cannot be a bad word at your company. Now what? I used to work in Korea, the south one, not the north one. That's what I have to say. Um, I was Kim Jong-il's hair, hairdresser for a while. Um, no, I wasn't. I worked in South Korea. Whenever I say I worked in Korea, everyone was always like, the south one? I'm like, no, of course the south one. Who works in North Korea? Um, I attended a conference there, and I, I attended a talk, and something about that talk has stuck with me, and I want to share it with you, and it works out nicely that I got to go first, because it's going to help you throughout the day, I think. I don't actually remember what the talk was about, probably about English teaching. Um, it may have been by this guy. Um, but what he talked about at the end was that you're going to see a lot of awesome talks today. You're going to learn a lot of cool ideas. You're going to be super excited to bring these ideas back to your company. Like I mentioned at the start, when you get back to the daily grind, the daily grind is going to win unless you have a plan and you're prepared to battle that daily grind. So what I would encourage you to do today is to come up with no more than three things that you are going to implement first thing Monday morning. You're going to write those down in your notebook, wherever you like to write things down. No more than three. It could be one, could be two, could be three. Four is too many. Five is definitely way too much. No more than three things that you're going to implement on day one. Okay? That gives you a list of achievable things that you're going to help burn down. Where do you pick those things from? I know I'm running out of time, so just really quickly. There are some things you're going to learn today that you have the ability to actually implement from start to finish. There are going to be some things you learn today that you have the ability to influence. Okay? And there are going to be some things you learn today that you just have no ability to change or influence. So when you're picking those things, pick the things that you can change. Give yourself some easy wins. Those easy wins will then translate into momentum, and you can start now trying to move into that influential circle and applying some of your leadership skills to start to move in and, and do bigger changes. Start small, pick a few things, and give yourself a goal that you are going to start implementing those things. I'm assuming you all go back to work on Monday. On Monday when you go back to work. I go back to work on Monday, so therefore you all do as well. Questions? Or clapping? 